Good morning, church. Well, let's see. I'll start out by saying that the flowers under the cross are in honor of the memory of, is it General Sergeant? Uh, Jesse Farmer, United States Marine Corps, and Chizuru Farmer and Doris Arthur by Victor and Janet Farmer. And if I got any of those names wrong, I apologize. Um, starting out this morning, I actually do get to have an announcement this morning. So if you're here and you're on the administrative, administrative board, uh, right after worship service, if you'll hang around for just two or three minutes, it won't take it all uh, long at all. We've got a quick decision to make. Um, nothing complicated or anything like that. Uh, any other announcements? Anything going on in the community? I know I think until 4 o'clock there's a farmer's market going on today. So if uh, the heat's killed anybody else's garden, you've got a place you can go get some vegetables today at least. See, I, I like this. There's, there's no we, this, that, or the other. It's real simple. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, let's open with prayer then. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, I thank you that once again we are able to gather in your house. Lord, as we have gathered, I pray, Holy Spirit, you who are already here with us, that you would minister to our hearts. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we have come, that you would provide guidance, you would provide comfort, you would provide correction, whatever our souls are in need of, Lord, that we would find it here this morning. I pray that all that we do and say here today is a sweet-smelling offering to you, and we lift this up all in the precious name of Jesus Christ, and amen. So, uh, my kids, have you found the duck yet? Okay, there we go. Okay, I've got others pointing it to it, but they haven't found it yet. Today we're going to talk about encounters with God in the sermon. And those are interesting things that come across in interesting ways, everywhere from burning bushes to dreams to talking animals, you name it, and God has done it. But the interesting thing about those encounters with God is... They were never really expected, and they really weren't looking for them, but they can catch you by surprise. So, uh, Father Tim over there, my rubber ducky, I don't know if the people in the stream can see it or not, but he's sitting on top of the piano, uh, was there the whole time, whether you were looking for him or not, right there he is. Much in the same way, God is with us all the time, whether we're looking for him or not. But oftentimes, he's ready and waiting to speak with us. So can you remember to be on the lookout for God every day? See, I, I like the head nods. I'll take that. Thank you. All right. As we come for our time of prayer, I'm going to change things up a little bit. Uh, there's a long-standing tradition that I like to use, and uh, now that everybody's comfortable with the way we were doing it, I'll change it. Oh, you're right. See, she's with me all the time, so I never think about introducing it. In case you don't know who the new person in church today is, this is my wife, uh, Beth. Uh, we've been married for going on nine years. We've known each other since middle school. No, we're not high school sweethearts or anything like that, but it, it, gets, it gets messed up a little bit in my, my head. But, but uh, Brody is with uh, one of the grandmas this morning. I don't know who he's with right now, but he's with one of the grandmas. So Beth actually gets to come with me today. So, uh, eh. I'm pretty sure it's nine years. <laughs> Be nine years in October. That's right. Or the, she's usually glaring, but yeah. <laughs> but yes, yes, indeed. But prayer, I'm speaking of that, pray for me. Um, 
Instead of me saying a prayer and pausing in the middle, what I would like us to do instead is to, to lift up our concerns. You can say a name or something that's going on. If you'd like to give us a little bit of information of what's going on, you're welcome to, but you don't have to. But at the end of it, say, Lord, in your mercy, and then all of us together will say, hear our prayers. Uh, so I'll start us off so you can kind of see how it works. I ask that you would keep my father in your prayers, Thomas Epling, uh, as he has reduced lung capacity, even with oxygen, when it comes to these extreme heat and the advanced humidity, it, it's, it's a difficult time for him. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. There you go. See, that's how it works. So who should we lift up today in prayer? Steve Smart. Steve Smart. Hear our prayers. Dana Hofstad, Lord in your mercy. Matt Green, Lord in your mercy. I heard Bailey family, is that right? Lord in your mercy. Give me the first name again. Danny. Annie? Danny. Danny is in the hospital recovering from surgery. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Father, we take this time now and lift these people up to you knowing that you have heard every name and every concern, both the spoken and unspoken concerns of our heart. Holy Father, we lift these up to you, knowing that you are still in control and still at work in this world. So we are praying for miracles, Lord. We're praying for comfort. We're praying for healing. We're praying for peace. And we know, O oh Lord, that you are already at work. But we pray that you would reveal that work to us. Now, Lord, we lift them up, entrusting them into your care. In the precious, holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now we have a special music this morning, so I'll turn it over. So the theme of uh, Nathan's uh, trilogy is uh, um, grace. So I think this one's very, very fitting. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion. 
nation be as long as life endures my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone Amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun refuse to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever As we continue in our series this morning, remember last week we, were, we met uh, Jacob and Esau, and we kind of learned that in some ways they were typical siblings, and in some ways they weren't, but they, they, <laughs> they battled with one another. They, they didn't always get along, and that kind of came to a head when Esau was out hunting, and Jacob was home, and Esau came starving to Jacob and traded his birthright for a bowl of crummy stew and bread. Now remember, in that day and age, the birthright was everything. If you were the firstborn son, then you got it all. And that meant if you weren't the firstborn son, you were going to be serving your brother pretty much your entire life. And Esau traded all that away for a bowl of soup, for lack of a better term. And Esau became so bitter about that and so angry about that, it, it grew and grew in him and to the point that he said, you know, if I just kill my brother, I don't have to worry about any of this nonsense anymore. And Jacob became aware of that, and, Jacob's, and uh, Esau's mother became aware of that. So she sends Jacob out on a, on a mission trying to save him. And we pick up with that here in uh, Genesis chapter 28, beginning in verse 10. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran and came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke with, from his sleep and said, Sure, thee the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! 
This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Let's pray this morning. Lord, as we have come, we pray that you would meet us here. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you minister to our hearts. But in all things, I pray, Lord, that you take me and hide me behind your cross, that this is your word for your glory alone, for the transformation of all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So throughout all of Scripture, this is the first time that we encounter Jacob alone. He's always either been with Esau, been with mom, been among everybody else in the tents. And I think it's interesting that the first time Jacob gets by himself, he has this encounter with God. And, I mean, he's not looking for an encounter to God. He's on this mission his mom has sent him on. He's really fleeing from his brother, and he, he travels until he can't travel because he's too tired. It's getting too dark. You get this kind of uh, this idea that he might not even even be prepared well for it because when it comes to lay down for the night... He grabs a rock for his pillow. Now, I don't know about you, I've had some pretty lousy pillows, but I've never really looked at a rock and thought, that sounds like a great idea. But he falls asleep, and in his sleep, he's given this vision. And theologians and scholars have debated about this vision ever since it was ever written down. Was it a ladder? Was it a staircase? Was it some kind of a pyramid ziggurat thing? I don't care if it was an elevator. That, that's not the important part of this. But he sees angels ascending and descending. And, it, you know, this would be, you know, amazing for him. And even more in the midst of that, God begins to speak. And I, I, Jacob's not even prepared for this because God begins speaking of a larger picture that at least in scriptures we get an idea that Jacob might not have even been aware of beyond something that Grandpa Abraham might have told him about. And let's be honest, we might not have always believed some of the stories Grandpa tell us. I don't know about you, but I got some pretty wild ones. So he begins talking about how I'm with you right now. Yes, I know you're in this circumstance. I'm, I'm going to take you through it and you're going to be just fine. But you also need to understand this bigger picture that's going on. And we know it as the Abrahamic covenant, that first covenant that God made and how your descendants are going to spread out all over the world and bless everybody. And that's going to happen and take place through you. And he begins describing all this stuff. And Jacob wakes up the next morning and goes, to use my quote earlier, holy cow. God is doing all these things, and God was right here, and I didn't even know it. And he grabs that rock that he'd used as a pillow, 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 excuse me, builds a pillar, sets the rock on top of it, pours oil on it, and what he did was create an altar. In response to his experience with God, he built an altar to honor God. Well, there's three things in this encounter that should catch our attention. The first is surprise. Jacob wasn't looking for an encounter with God. He wasn't told, go to this mountain and you'll encounter God. God, you know, beyond maybe saying, oh, Lord, help me. God's the furthest thing from Jacob's mind right now. He's just trying to get away from his brother. And God, in, he has this encounter with God as a complete surprise. And we need to understand that God often works in that moment of surprise when it comes to encounters. I've known people that had an encounter with God in their youth and have spent their entire lives trying to recreate that encounter because they have this kind of misguided understanding that that's the only way that God works. I experienced God this way, which means that's how God speaks to me, and that's the only way God will ever work. But when you look through the Bible, God, God meets with people in all kinds of different ways. We've got dreams, we've got visions, we have talking animals, we have burning bushes, we have you know, 
thunder and fire and smoke descending on mountains and temples. God continually reaches out to people in ways that we were never expecting. So we often look for God, but we, we look for God everywhere, not just in the ways that we expect, because he's you know, when we experience him, when we have those moments when he becomes just as clear as possible, it's often going to be in a way we weren't expecting. So Jacob shows us that we serve a God of surprises. The second is that the latter shows that God is still at work because the angels are going up and going down and there's business that's happening, which tells me that the, the Lord didn't wind up the clock, set it down, and then leave it alone. There's a group of Christians that believe that God created everything, decreed that it was good, and then went and sat down somewhere and left creation alone. Now, I don't know how you get that when you look at all the different ways God interacted with people throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, but that belief is still kind of strong. But we see just in this vision that, no, God is still at work, that there are still powerful things happening, and the Lord is still in control. And the final thing in this scripture is that Jacob was part of a bigger picture that he wasn't even aware of. And oftentimes, when we have experiences or encounters with God, we are, our eyes are open to the fact that, yes, God cares about everything that is going on in our lives, but that we, as the children of God, are a part of something so much bigger and so much greater than we often ever even begin to think about. That when God said that I'm going to use you to change the world, He meant it. And that by our actions as his children, the implications can go worldwide. So this, this begins to get even more eye-opening when we begin to apply it ourselves. And one of the ways that we can look at that comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, <clears throat> and begins in verse 12. And it says, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit, excuse me, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The, for, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, <clears throat> Excuse me. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So like I said, we, we spend all this time often trying to have these experience or encounters with God. And what Paul is trying to get the folks to understand, not only the original uh, people this was written to, but us, is that we have the Holy Spirit with us here, right now. So Paul is trying to teach to a congregation that he's never met. And honestly, that's why I think the book of Romans is so understandable and so adaptable, why it's held so true for so long, because Paul is still writing to a congregation he's never met when we read it. So he goes into more detail, is more expansive in, the Ro in Romans than he does in other places. So he's trying to show them that as the children of God, they are walking with God every day. And also that that should make a difference in our lives. Because as you see in every one of the letters that Paul wrote, being a Christian, according to Paul, demands a radical reordering of our thinking. 
old concepts like law, inheritance, indebtedness, life, death, conversion. Everything is different now, he says, because you are now a child of God. He's trying to get us to understand that living in the light of the resurrected Lord, walking with God every day, has meaning in our lives, especially in the understanding that suffering is endemic, in other words, normal, to the human condition. And God uses this broad term when he uses suffering because he's not just talking about plagues or destruction or anything like that. He's also talking about that daily struggle with temptation in the flesh. So he uses this little word to cover this huge expanse of understanding. But he says that that suffering is normal. The struggle is real might be another way of phrasing it. And if you haven't figured that out yet, give it a little bit more time and you'll find out that life can be hard sometimes. But what he says is that even though it might get difficult, that the greater truth is that our cosmic redemption is near. In other words, yes, Jesus Christ came and his shed blood, we find the forgiveness of our soul, forgiveness of our sins, but that Jesus is coming back. And when that happens, that not only will everything be made right, but we mean everything. There will be no more sin. There will be no more evil. Everything will be like it was intended to be before humanity messed it up. So Paul begins explaining this using legal terms that if we don't understand what's being used, we start getting all this interesting uh, male-oriented language. Because remember, this is still the day and age where the firstborn son gets everything. So when Paul begins talking about adoptions as sons and heirs, and he starts talking about you are a son of God, he's using that as in the language of you become a firstborn son in God. The firstborn son gets everything, and as the children of God, every single one of us is a firstborn son of God, so we all get everything. Some people don't get a little bit of it while others get the majority of it. All of us get salvation. All of us get eternal life. All of us get everything. That's the legal terminology that he begins using here. And it's rooted because he's writing to the Romans in their adoption law. And the Roman adoption law is really cool. And it's one of those things as a foster parent that I love. Because in the Roman understanding of adoption... I can go and say, Robin is now my firstborn son. And legally, there's no complications with that whatsoever. In fact, not only does it say that on such and such, Robin became Nathan's firstborn son. By the way, age, gender, it has no meaning. I'm I'm setting an error in this. It's set in the Roman understanding of adoption. That means she has always been my heir. That there has no, you know, that it's always been. Now, this even means in like, well, we get the, the, the prodigal son, you know, the, the, the son wanders away, becomes estranged. In the Roman understanding, even if I had a firstborn son and we, and they became estranged, if I make, if I adopt Robin as my firstborn son, it doesn't matter if my estranged firstborn comes back or not. She will always be, always has been the heir. So when he comes back, they got to figure that out because legally they're both the heir. And I love that imagery because what he's saying is that in God, you are the adopted children of God. But he's using the Roman image of adoption that when God says, you're my child eternally, that was true. There was never a time when we wandered away from sin. There was never any of that. It's all wiped clean and the, the, the birth certificate says born to God. And that's amazing, and that's powerful, and that's beautiful, and it's something that we need to hold on to, is the truth that when God, when we say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, and you are my Lord, and I need you, he says, you are forgiven, and you are mine, and that is sealed for all time. You're his child. It never, something different never existed in that moment. And that's why he says, in the good times or the bad times, when we cry out, Abba, Father, or we might say, oh God, help me, God listens. Because in this understanding of how God looks at us, we are his precious children who he loves dearly. 
I've heard it phrased this. God calls us by our end destination, not by our beginning. At all times when we come to him. That's why he says that the sufferings of this world are nothing compared to what's coming. Because he's looking at that completed image where everything is made right, where the children of God are. And it's not just about waiting until heaven. It's a declaration that I have the ability to walk with God every single day. That I have the ability to have that Jacob moment, that Jacob experience in the Spirit often. That when I seek God out, the Lord responds. Therefore, Paul says, I won't allow myself to fall into sinful temptations of the flesh and fall into old habits because that leads me further away from God. And I don't want to get further from God. I want to get closer to God. And just like Jacob, when he had his encounter with God, he built an altar. So we, when we have an encounter, build an altar to God. Only we say, I am that altar. That my life might be a sacrifice to God. That how I live, how I speak, how I act, that my actions might proclaim the glory of God. That somebody else might see it and want to know more. That somebody else might see it and get a glimpse of home and that that desire would draw them to seek out God. So we don't look for the actions, uh, for the desires of flesh to become normative. We're looking for our identity as Christians to become so radical and so new, a new identity for us that it empowers us to live ethically and holy lives, no matter what times we might be living in or where we might be living in. Jacob had that encounter and built an altar. We have an encounter, and our lives become the altar. So Paul closes us with this thought, and I'll close as well. It's the idea that all of creation eagerly awaits for the day when the body of Christ lives like this, and that day when God ultimately restores creation. So our declaration is this. Lord, let our lives be an altar that we might live holy lives that glorify you and point others to you every moment of every day. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So church, I pray that you have an encounter today with God, if you haven't already, and that encounter shakes you so much that it says, I need to do something. I need to get closer. I need to get back. And that you establish an altar in your heart. Go out and be that for the world, church. God bless.